Yeah, we are now live. So good morning, good evening, or good afternoon, wherever you are in the world. Welcome really to another uh, webinar live with uh, Tvori and with our passionate and talented designers. Uh, so we have here today Mohamed Sayar, pronounced correctly, right? Good. Uh, and he's basically going to be with us, tell us uh, telling us a little bit about his transition from 2D to spatial design. So. Uh, before we just dive into questions, what I would also like to remind uh, everybody is to do ask questions. So one reason why you're here, and I, I think it's a great opportunity to ask and interact with us, with Mohamed, with the community. Uh, so please uh, ask questions, don't hesitate to just drop them in there and we'll do our best while I type, while I look at the question, while I follow Mohamed uh, to answer those. Um, so really excited about this, Mohamed, thank you so much for being here. No worries. Thank you for having me. So, we are, you had a bit of a, like, um, sometimes what I heard, uh, kind of like a different path, right, that brought you to, to explore yeah. uh, this, uh, uh, this journey and in general spatial design. So, why don't you maybe start quickly, right, telling us a little bit about what is basically uh, your uh, formal education. How did it all start? Mm -hmm. All right. So, my journey into design generally was a bit, kind of different because I studied electronic engineering back in university. But when I was studying um, my major, I was involved in the design. And it's been almost 15 years that I'm in, in the design industry working as I started as graphic designer, working advertising, um, print design, marketing. And then um, I think it was around seven years ago, which I shifted and, and more focused on the digital product design, designing for web applications, for mobile applications. And that was kind of the, the entire journey, brief history of my journey into design. Okay, so it started basically as engineer, then 2D design, and then moving more into digital, uh, yeah. into the digital world. And um, so, and, and how did you end up there? So what, what, what was the trigger? What was the drive to move from being an engineer uh, to into something that is more creative, right? Because engineering and creativity are not those those things that really match really well together. How did that How did that happen? I wouldn't say that. I think okay. engineering is could could be a really um, creative discipline as well. But I found myself more kind of free or more creative when I was um, involved in designing. It is funny how I got started in design because. I remember um, in two days, we're going to have um, Persian New Year. And I remember it was like 17 years ago, Persian New Year, I was on my cousin's home and I saw the playing with some software called Photoshop. And I got interested, obviously back then I borrowed the CD, wasn't any Those license or subscription, <laughs> exactly. No subscription, no planning, um, copied that, installed and started working with Photoshop and I got so excited about the possibilities. Yeah. That's basically everything. I saw everything is possible. So you could mix and mix things together. You could come up with new ideas. You could create literally yeah. from scratch. And that was really kind of inspiring for me. Fascinating. And, and also like wonder, this is so close to the stage we are now with immersive reality, with immersive technology. And maybe we are getting ahead of ourselves, but I, I think that we are going to experience a similar path. Uh, for that and uh, and then so that was the 2d part right that got you into the yeah. design as a whole and that that interest into instead the, the spatial aspect of it how, how yeah. did that how did that happen because i believe that many of the people that might be listening uh, to us uh, might be in a similar situation where they have a background in 2d design they are creative mm -hmm. and they find this interesting appealing exciting what was it for you that got you into into the spatial design what got me into a special design? I think the first trigger was with um, Google Cardboard six years, six, seven years ago. Um, as soon as I tried that, I thought that's it. Because one of the things that I had with my career um, always is was that it was the thing that I couldn't pick one discipline. I was um, jumping between different disciplines, trying motion design, trying um, a bit of VFX, graphic design, print design. But as soon as I jump into a spatial design and designing for VR or AR experiences, I noticed that it seems the perfect place to combine all those experiences, all those skills and softwares 
and come up with one solution or one product that could get benefit from all of those experiences. Yeah. And that's the beauty of XR design. So everyone from no matter background could jump in from sound design, architecture, biology, 2D design, 3D design, game design. There is so much room for everyone, not even designers, but developers, for everyone that are in, that are basically interested in that area. They could easily jump in. Yeah. Um, not easily, but they could come I, in and start agree, experiencing that. And I also think that many of them could also have a real advantage. Uh, in a sense that if we think, for example, very often is that the 2D design that makes this transition or is interested, mm -hmm. but an architect has a completely way of thinking when you compare it to, to someone that is designing on a flat surface. So all those kind of people uh, that are instead that, that think differently, for which brain thinks differently, I think that exploring this area, I think it's something that is, could really benefit the, the industry <laughs> as a sure, yeah. for, for, for sure. And then also them, because it's, it's a new way of applying their skill to something that is actually, uh, um, let's say, in their need of their support, let's say. True, uh, true. And um, so throughout this journey, right, uh, mm -hmm. throughout this, this learning journey, um, uh, so I hear Inga saying, can we hear you? I think everybody, everybody can hear me, right? Uh, I, I would say assume yes, because otherwise they would have told me. Uh, but the question was, um, <laughs> throughout this journey, what is, um, okay, okay, so there is just a slight thing, well, we are going to move ahead. Um, what were basically the skills that you have got, right? W what were the skills that you couldn't live without, uh, that were key to allow you to really start creating something? I think the first thing that you probably need to understand to have a basic knowledge about is just to understand the, the basic knowledge of 3D, not being a 3D designer, not being a 3D artist and jumping in deeply, but to understand how the works, like knowing about like what's the texture, what, what's mesh, how do you design, a, not, not design, what's the differences between low poly and high poly resolution, the lighting and the basically the basic of a spatial design. That's, I think, the most fundamental skill that you need before trying to design anything for XR. Okay. So, and with regards to um, the, the kind of like, the, the, I wouldn't say the mindset, but the kind of things that you really need, right? So if you say, mm -hmm. so you are a 2D designer, you have been, for example, having a lot of experience with Photoshop, Figma, it's like, what will be the next step? Right? So, okay, I want to start creating something. How am I going to do it? Am I going to download something from Sketchfab, for example, and mm -hmm. try to play around with it in AR? Am I going to, um, I don't know, uh, maybe you, you start learning a bit of Blender or, or I don't know, or use maybe anything. So what, what would you give as an advice to someone that is approaching this? Because actually we have got questions like, what should I use mm -hmm. to start doing it, to, to, uh, uh, to start in, in spatial design? So what would you say? Hmm. That's a really good question. Um, I actually prepared a few kind of 3D presentation to talk de deeply about those things. But to answer your question, um, it could be really overwhelming if you want to start design for XR. You, you see, you go and read, okay, I need to learn 3D, I need to learn how to code, I need to learn um, how to develop and push these things, I need to have access to a VR headset, I need to have access to a PC VR ready, and those, all of those hardware, a cable, and stuff like that. But the good point is, you could start with whatever you have, no matter what. Is it pen and pencil? Yeah, start with pen and pencil and sketch your ideas. Try to imagine, cut those things out, and do a paper prototype, which is really legit, um, kind of framework in the industry to cut out those sketches and play with those like playing with dolls and trying to imitate the interaction. The next step, let's say, if you're designing for AR would be using your smartphone. There are multiple applications that allows you quickly create um, simple interactions in AR like Adobe Aero or if you're using an iOS device, um, um, Apple Reality Composer is one of the best which allows you having interaction and physics. If we're talking about VR, I remember the first um, kind of design that I've done for VR was just using a panoramic grid. If you Google panoramic grid or a rectangular grid, um, there is a grid 
that you could design on top of that. If you import that in Photoshop or Affinity Photo, you could literally turn that to a sphere, look around and design and draw on, on these sphere wall and move around. That was the first um, yeah. experiment designing for VR. Back then, I didn't have access to, a, to um, a VR headset, and that helped a lot. But if you have a VR headset, the best thing is to jump into VR as soon as possible. That's kind of the, the bridge between the, the, the differences between 2D design and designing for a special for VR and AR. Yeah, you yeah, need yeah. to try, you need to test your ideas as soon as possible within the, the medium. You cannot continue designing in 2D on, on monitors for VR without testing that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, people are telling me that they hear me only on one uh, uh, earphone. So let me try to do one thing now and see if I can fix very quickly that. If I don't, we will uh, go on with this. Um, it seems... Yeah. I think it's still gonna be mono, but doesn't matter. Let me just put this back. Yeah. So, uh, then my next question is basically, uh, how do you turn an idea into basically the simplest mm -hmm. thing that you can show to someone? Because along the process, along the creative process, what you want to is to, let's say, explore, right? Brainstorm and, and try to think what the solution is going to be. And at some point you come up with something that is the minimum thing that you can show to explain an idea to someone. How... Mm -hmm. How do you do that? How do you turn that idea into the simplest thing that you show to someone? It really depends on the purpose of that kind of prototype or the level of the process that we're talking about. If it's some like internal review, it could be as simple as some blocks. I could like use a red cube and call that character. So every designer could assume that's the character. I could have another cube, color it black or blue and call that enemy that's fine for this level. Mm -hmm. But if you're talking about reviewing or showing the concept and having like a meeting with the stakeholders, which are non-designers, you need to go with, a, we need to go deeper. You need to come up with better design. So that that's when you could use um, prototyping tools like Tigori, that, that is really helpful. So sometimes, I mean, I do usually start from blocking in VR. So I jump in, I use, the primitive shapes to put together the idea to see if it's physical, if it's really um, um, kind of affordable in VR. And it's because sometimes you have ideas in your mind which are crazy or not doable. So you need to basically turn those things to some something tangible. And then you could progress. You could replace those with models from Sketchfab. If you don't know how to model 3D, that's absolutely fine. There are millions of amazing free 3D models out there already rigged, already with texture. You could import those from Sketchfab, from Poly, and play with those kind of things. Yeah, Poly until it lasts. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, uh, I do have one thing that I want to ask. Guys, I haven't seen any question, and that's made me feel very sad. Uh, I think also Mohammed is very sad, uh, even though it doesn't show. Uh, <laughs> but do, guys, please, I mean, uh, uh, ask questions. Now, I do have another one, a uh, question for, for Mohammed, but please, do not hesitate, get in touch, and, and, and just type it down, and we'll answer it. The follow-up question to what you just said, Mohammed, is that, so in that case, the kind of concept that you were describing to me were study concept, felt like. So it felt like mm -hmm. this is a character, this is the menu, this is where it could be the button, this is where, so mm -hmm. it, it felt like. And I'm not asking this as a tricky question, right? We at Vori, we love animation because we believe it tells a story. But that doesn't mean that I'm asking this question as a little question, right? I really mean it. Would, how, what would be the value of a static, um, uh, of, of a static design when mm -hmm. showing a, a specific, uh, let's say, uh, UI or is explaining an experience. Would that still work? Is that enough? And for what? Um, that could still be helpful, to be honest, because even in the um, digital product design, we still use those kind of static level of prototyping or design deliverables. It, in a special design, that helps a lot with um, ergonomy. For example, let's say up, up intentionally with some of those uh, 3D presentations that I'm going through later on, I've intentionally designed that in a way that is really hyped when you come into design with VR. 
But going through that, you'll notice that it's so much of neck rotation and head rotation. So without doing any animation, without doing any interactive within your prototype, just doing a volumetric design, a static volumetric design would help you a lot around, okay, for example, I'm going to put a, a button. Is the label of the button legible in that space? Is it too close? Is it too far? Is it reachable if I'm going for the direct interaction? Is it um, stable if I'm going for the raycast interaction? So all those kind of questions could be answered even within the static prototype. So you don't need um, to animate everything to answer all of those questions. Yes, some of the questions um, could be just answered when you see an interactive prototype or an animation prototype. And some concepts like the, the, the VR keyboard that I worked on, you need some sort of animation to convey the message in a better way. And I think that you brought up a good fact, uh, a good point. So there is a level where uh, space matters, and you can go by and and have a, a full. Uh, you can learn a lot by just putting static stuff around. There is a level of things that you will know with having animation, right, uh, uh, working, uh, so that tells the tell more of a story transition. And then there is another layer that you would get only when you get actual interaction on. Right, exactly. and, uh, and yeah. another level when the product would be Unity, right? So I think yeah. that it's 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 a matter that should be kind of like the right level of fidelity for the exactly for, for the right stage of the design. Exactly. Uh, I have a question. Reading it, uh, how should VR focus companies prepare for the AR revolution that is supposedly coming? Yeah, how a company is gonna deal with the fact that. Apple, Apple uh, AR glasses are coming, supposedly. Uh, mm. Facebook is, is posting every half a day research and, and, and new interaction systems for their own products. Uh, how should VR Focus company prepare for this AR uh, revolution? All right. So in my opinion, VR and AR are so connected and close to each other. You cannot talk about VR without having AR in mind or vice versa. The fact is, at this stage, with the current technology that we are having, not within the companies, not in research labs, the, the, technologies, the technologies that are available for consumers, there is still a huge gap between use cases for VR and AR. You cannot immerse any player in AR experiences in a way that you can with like really low quality graphics in VR. Even with like a really cartoony style in VR, you could achieve a high level of immersion, but in AR, it's not possible. On the other hand, let's say if you're going to buy a new piece of furniture for your environment, for your flat, the best approach would be AR. VR wouldn't help you a lot because you need to see the piece that you're going to, to buy in, in real situation. So there are different use cases Yes, there would be some cases that you could merge these two together, but at the moment with the current technologies, I don't believe this gap, this huge gap would um, vanish soon. Yeah, so I hope I, I answered that in a so way maybe, understandable. Maybe it's not the time yet for some of them. That's what you, what, what you would say to kind of like heavily invest. And it's, it's a matter of focusing on specific use cases instead of getting abroad. There's yeah, at the moment, AR. Sorry, at the moment, AR is really focused on um, kind of uh, commercial experiences like e-commerce. So like IKEA in place and stuff like that. AR is really focused on that. VR at the moment is using game to democratize uh, the, the medium. So they are fighting for attention. They are fighting for market. There will be a day that these two meet each other and complete each other. But at the moment, I think there's still a huge gap between those. So I do have another question. So we, we, we asked for it and they're coming. That's great. Uh, from Anil uh, Sapkota, he mentioned, uh, I want to get into designing spatial app for kids learning. Mm -hmm. Anything you recommend to start with? I would recommend gathering as many as possible kids around you and observe them, how they work, how they play with the, the physical objects the relationship, the, the size relation between their bodies, their hands, their fingers and objects, the amount of movement that they could have in the real physics and try to replicate those without any crazy ideas, without any trying to breaking all, all rules or groundbreaking things, 
just creating the basic um, kind of simulation of physical interaction in VR. Because sometimes, I mean, I love technology, I love XR, and I went through that. I, I, I got trapped into the um, the thinking, the mindset of now everything is possible, and I need to push everything out of the boundaries. That won't work. So we need to start small. We need to go for the minimum physical kind of um, achievable approaches. Yeah. So and because that brings back also like the designer is not just about building mock up in the UI. It's about let's look at the user. Let's look at how they interact. So and then there is so much more that, that you technically can do without developing anything. Right. If you look at what is available also on the market, you can already watch video. You can understand and look at the user in their environment. So then indeed that, that, that is uh, let's not forget that. Do have another question from Adrian Tamas. How do you treat haptic or tactile design? Do you have any experience with that? Yeah, I, actually, I'm working on a few uh, concepts for um, haptic. For example, one of the the idea of VR is to get rid of the controllers and use your hands as the main input device. The problem is if you poke, trying to poke something in there, there's no haptic, you won't understand. So one of the solutions that oculus came is the pinch because you're using your natural natural haptic um haptic gloves are coming but are another piece of hardware another uh, investment and every pound or dollar that you spend you're basically narrowing down your customers uh there's another thing that's really interesting is the neural interfaces so following the same electric electronic signal that comes from your brain to your muscles to activate they're reading those and eventually they could affect that at the moment they're still in labs in research labs they're not out there to be used but um haptic is really challenging um area when when you design for vr or ar um, experiences yeah, yeah. And by the way, Adrian, uh, there was also another article from ETH Zurich. They come up with basically with a way where tapping, there is a wristband that tapping on a surface detect the vibration of the finger on the surface on the wrist. Yeah. Basically, a sign. So it's kind of like mixing a bit of augmented, uh, let's say, hand tracking with the yeah. additional precision that that kind of like tap is detected to make things. I, I mean, of course, it's still research. Uh, you can find the article on actually on LinkedIn uh from uh in the post that i made so if you find your yeah. and see what i posted that may be something useful. exactly to to elaborate a bit more on that for example the concept that i'm at the moment i'm kind of working on is many of us uh, are wearing um a smart watches or smart bands and they're usually bluetooth enabled and they usually have some sort of haptic so why not connecting let's say we have an application within a card or your vr headset that could connect with your a smartwatch and you could feel those vibration on your watch so already have a device so if you could find a way connecting these two at least one hand is sold so you could use this as kind of alternative hand the other one could just activate the pinch or other kind of um, gestures yeah. and this could be your menu with a bit of more in-depth navigation yeah yeah and i think it's very fascinating because this is really getting like uh, we we are not even there when we can get a, a comfortable enough we are headset and then but what about haptics what about and then this extra layer that, of course they have to go in parallel right but it's it's certainly uh, a very fascinating challenge we have got a question from i'm not sure i'm gonna pronounce his name correctly but it's Feller. It sounds French, uh, but is there a way to bridge to the to bridge to the software such as Figma to be used for quick 3D mockups, or do we need to recreate all our current 3D assets from scratch in a separate 3D software? And I think this could be a good bridge, <laughs> maybe to go to the next question. So I think, uh, Felo, you're gonna get your answer uh, by the end of the by the end of the or at least our answer, right? Or or one answer. It's not the the answer, uh, but I wanna go through. Um, uh, so the, the qu next question will be like, can you guide us kind of like through the various steps that lead basically to a finished product or uh, telling mm -hmm. us a little bit about your involvement, how, how is your role as a UX designer from through this process, right? C c can you tell us about that? Yeah. Um, first of all, uh, I need to say that I believe there's no finish or done state for any no. digital product. So it's always iteration. Um, I'm coming from a digital product background, so I'm following the normal methodologies, design thinking, 
and we always start with the definition. So let's focus and clarify what we what what's the goal, what's the main problem, or if it's a personal project, what's the main motivation that runs you through these kind of things. So when you have that super clear, the next step is to come with as many as possible ideas. So don't limit yourself with one or two. Don't fall in love with your ideas. Produce as much as possible. It doesn't matter which medium. If you have access to a VR headset and you're confident with that, why not jump in and start blocking out your ideas or start drawing using uh, drawing application, Tilt Brush, Creel, Sketchfab, even um, um, Gra Gravity Sketch, even Tigori. Next step would be picking one or two or three of your ideas, depending your time, and trying to shape those in a, in a more presentable way. So you could sell those ideas to someone out of this team. So you could convey the message, you could test that. And obviously, the last would be testing, which requires um, interactive prototypes to see if it's really helping to solve the main problem that you started with. So maybe uh, because you have kind of like laid out some part of this process, right? In like kind of like a tree environment, I believe, right? We were discussing yeah. something. Maybe you can hop in and, and show us a little bit about that because maybe Federer is going to also then understand a bit what we're talking about, right? Uh, sure, yeah. That they could be. Um, yes. to, before jumping in, um, to quickly answer those, there's actually a really useful plugin for Figma. Uh, I think it's called XR Draft, if I'm not mistaken, that helps you quickly turn your 2D design within Figma into an HTML link that you could try within Google Cardboard or VR headsets. It won't allow you to have 3D objects and volumetric layouts, but it, it, it's a good start to see, okay, the layout, the main navigation could work or not. Work. The next step would be using some sort of 3D software, Blender or anything else for coming up with the uh, volumetric menu. Yeah. Um, I'm going to connect my quest. It probably take a few minutes, so please bear with me. No, we, we, we will. And by the way, there is uh, Bruno Viegas who mentioned a product is only done when you give up on it. That's uh, exactly. Can we can we write it somewhere? Maybe we should put it as a motto on top of our screen. <laughs> it's uh, it's very good. So, Pilar, I hope it was uh, uh, help, uh, useful. Meanwhile, I got Adrian. They were working on on artificial skin. Uh, to be honest, regarding ATH, ETH Zurich, uh, I had a, I had a thought when I saw their video. So it was really fascinating to see basically how can then a surface, like for example, our desk, also turn into an interface, right? And I was wondering, how are they going to, or how they did design those interactions, right? So I wonder basically, um, like, what is the process that they are following in order to design a new way of interacting with a table that technically has uh, UI or, or objects or content on it. That is, I think, something very, very fascinating. I tried to send them an email, didn't got a reply yet, but uh, I think uh, I'm, I'm going to try again because uh, it seems like there is a lot of absolutely cool stuff going on in there. Um, yeah, uh, designing on uh, 360 images stuff. Uh, I agree. Uh, but uh, yeah, everybody found your suggestion very useful, uh, uh, Mohammed, about uh, XR Draft. One of the pains is to stream VR. It is, it is. But yeah, here we go. Check this out. Let me know if you can see my Tivori empty scene. We can see. Is that right? Because, yeah. okay. Perfect, because I cannot see you anymore. I'm going to load um, the first scene that I'm going to talk to you yeah. about a bit of the kind of process behind things. Obviously, this is not meant to be the answer. This is not meant to be the best or the only solution. This is just the way that I'm using at the moment. Um, and it's based on my learning, so could be used. The, the first scene is a bit um, heavy, so it will take a couple of minutes to load. Yeah, here we are. So um, as we talked about the process, I tried to come up with some sort of a 3D presentation for that. Um, can you see that we properly? Can. We can, very well. Perfect. All right, so um, as I said, I usually start 
on defining the problem to, to uh, capture as many areas uh, around that problem. Then I'll jump to I'll jump to ideation. So to produce as many as possible ideas, I'll pick a few of those and jump to prototyping. And the, the important thing is testing those ideas and not shipping those quickly. As Bruno said, everything from test needs to go back to definition, go through ideation, prototype, and, and test. So it's basically a circle that goes again and again and again till you have something um, shippable for your customers. And that's not even the end of the journey because you learn more from the actual use cases, you apply those, you see, you face new problems, you ideate for those, and it goes on and on. Um, another thing that I wanted to share with you is, because I've been asked many times how we could start, what are the, the things, the tips, if you will, to, to start with um, kind of designing for XR, designing for AR and VR. So I tried to come up with kind of five easy steps um, which I believe by following those, you could jump in. The first step is um, thinking in 3D. So for many years as 2D designer, I've tried to be focused on the actual 2D surface. I try to fake the, the, the depth. I try to use shadows in a way, you to use the Bella effect in a way to fake the depth. But when you design for AR and VR, you have the real depth. And it's really important to think in 3D and get rid of the traditional 2D canvases as soon as you can. So if you have access to a VR headset, if you have access to a smart um, phone that is AR enabled, please jump in as soon as you can. The next step that I would suggest is learn the vocabulary, learn the terminology, learn the, um, the terms that are in industry use. So start reading or Googling about vocabulary or glossary in VR. You'll learn about what's, for example, the three degree of freedom that would lead you to Raycast, that would lead you to um, cave in, in inside out tracking, outside in tracking, and that would help you a lot understanding the technology and the medium that you're going to design for. Without this step, your designs will end up with just concepts that are not feasible to do. So that's really important. The next kind of tip or step would be starting small. It's really important to start from the smallest idea, the smallest possible beat, because it could get really overwhelming if you try to add more things, if you try to perfect every stages and everything. So uh, the starting small is really a um, smart way of doing things. Yeah, and if I can add also one thing, we were talking with other designers and one thing that was also like, Sometimes studying or thinking about micro interaction other than full user journey could be like a good way to look at it, right? It's don't exactly. think about the whole experience, but hey, how, how can I drag that lever? How can I push that button? How can I, how can a user, uh, you know, uh, be surrounded in space and maybe something simple as you, as you said, I think starts more with micro interaction instead of looking at the whole user flow. I think it's also a, a good, uh, a good starting point. Exactly. Um, the next kind of step or trick would be play daily. It's not just playing games. Try to install and go through every possible AR or VR experiences, no matter from the franchises, no matter from big companies or small companies. Try to learn from their mistakes. Try to learn from their success to understand what makes you feel the motion sickness. For example, I'm really prone to motion sickness as a designer working in VR is really bad, but that it is what it is. And I need to understand what makes me uh, so sick, what, what, what could I deal with? And I could achieve those just by playing as many as I can. It's really important to try other existing experiences, VR, AR experiences, that, that's really, really helpful. And the last bit is have fun, Le really have fun. Try to make it fun for yourself. These icons that you can see I have uh, created in um, Adobe Medium, which is another VR application. These are not perfect. The mesh are absolutely rubbish and I'm not a 3D designer. I just enjoy creating those things and I'm keeping those fun for myself. Because if I focus too much on problem solving, on coming up with feasible solutions, 
it could easily burn me up. This is the, the experience that I talked about. So this kind of dashboard is one of the pattern that you could see in almost every VR concept. So it's really popular and you think, okay, when I'm designing for VR, I have all the spaces. So why not using that? I intentionally designed this in a way to talk about this. Body ergonomy is really important. Our neck as human is comfortable to rotate around 30 degree on each side. But it doesn't mean that we should force and force user and use the entire rotation if it, it's not adding any value. I could have easily arranged these vertically. I could have easily make those in two rows and focus in, in such a small area and have user focus without rotating. Because imagine I'm standing here, I need to rotate here and rotate my neck fully back to see, to read those kind of things. Legibility and having these items in a perfect um, uh, ergonomic um, situation is really important. So I think we should avoid um, going for just fancy designs and without uh, thinking uh, those truly. If it's not any question about this, I would load um, one of the concepts that I created using Tibori. Yeah, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, any question, guys, don't hesitate uh, to ask, right? Uh, still as a reminder, go ahead. <laughs> Okay, so if you have followed the um, videos that Gabriella shared for this webinar, you have probably seen this experience. So one of the really non-pleasing experiences in VR is typing. So there are two main methods for typing in VR. One, which you could call drumstick, you always have sticks attached to your controllers and you need to literally tap on the keys to type. So it's really tiring. You could say that I need to move my wrist so many times to type a sentence. Another method is called ray casting. So you need to aim with a cast shooting from your controller. You need to aim for the keyboard and use the trigger. It's really shaky and it's, it's not fast enough. So I tried to come up with a concept to help with typing in VR. At first, I started, okay, what not using the thumbsticks and doing the same kind of interaction that probably you experience it with um, Xbox or PlayStation trying to type with the controller. So you use the thumbsticks uh, to go through the keyboard keys and use the trigger. Then I realized so many times that I'm in VR, I'm in a sitting situation and I'm landing my hands on my knees or somewhere else that's easier for me to type instead of holding my hands always in the air trying to stick or trigger that leads to this concept which you are going to see so with holding the trigger with some sort of a breaking gesture you could break keyboards into half each of those half will be attached to your keyboard to your controller and no matter where you're um, moving this it will follow your controller and you could still use that. So you break the keyboard, you use your thumbstick to explore, to basically hover around the keys and you use your trigger to type in. Yeah. And so, in this case, for example, the disposition for... of the buttons and the keyboard itself, uh, how, mm -hmm. how, how was that kind of like, uh, talk, because there would be many different ways in which they could, this could exactly. have been arranged. Exactly. So for example, back then I used um, Microsoft Market to block different ideas. I came up with love laying these keys around as a circular. I, I came up with having the um, control keys like shift and return in a different position. So I came up with a few ideas, but at the end, we need to make sure that we are giving kind of a similar experience to people because people are so used to the current layout of the keyboard. If you come up with a really crazy new layout for the keyboard, it means you're asking people for a really steep learning curve and yeah. I would break the immersion and that would uh, basically break the productivity. 
when you even now if you jump between different vr applications you'll understand for example the grab button this button here do does many things in different applications and that's not good because you expect the same behavior as a user you expect the same behavior uh of a, a single button in many applications but so because of those things i tried to come up with the simplest layout for a keyboard, keyboard. then i do have a question here right because so you would say okay then people should be consistent or should find a consistent way to kind of like uh for, for some kind of like experiences interfaces so th there should be kind of like a consensus but yeah. the fact is that currently it's kind of like the wild west right so everybody's trying something exactly. new and that is also good because people are discovering new things and the danger is are we going to stick for example with 2, 2d ui because otherwise it might be for example uh, overwhelming for users because that's what they're used to and we are not going to innovate so how do you see that balance between sticking with what works and that sometimes could be a, a, a translation of the uh, 2d word with innovating mm -hmm. and doing crazy stuff how do you do how do you find the balance okay don't get me wrong as a designer i love to do crazy stuff uh -huh. that's the promise and i do that a lot when i'm trying to do something fun but ask yourself does it add any value by doing crazy? For example, one of the first mistakes when people jump in uh, designing in 3D is to turn every possible element into 3D. If you try to make a text 3D, you're basically reducing the legibility. A text should be easily uh, readable, legible. So you cannot use that. And that's if you go through the history of the dashboard design for Oculus Home, you can see they have tried many different things like coming up from 3D, uh, layouts, volumetric UI, and they ended up with some sort of flat UI, it's a 2D UI, laid in a uh, spatial grid, that kind of a sweet spot for uh, visibility. So that's really important. Yes, I could arrange these keys in crazy ways. I could float those, I could use different levels, but does that add any value? Yeah. It will really help the, the, the purpose. Yeah, I think uh, I think it's a good point. So absolutely. Thanks very much, uh, Mohamed. And uh, I have uh, Simon who asked a question. How is your workflow to import 3D files from Maquette to Tvori? Did you do that or not? Yeah. So, uh, for example, I use Maquette because uh, it's kind of the most completed library when it comes to UI design. So you have all the headsets, yeah. all the uh, controllers, and it was really um, kind of easy to jump in to block out ideas. Yeah. Then I exported those from Marquette. I couldn't import them directly to Tivori. I needed, I ended up importing those in Blender, trying to clean up those meshes because some of the uh, meshes that I imported from Marquette needed to be flipped in the normals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so it, the process was basically exporting from Marquette, importing in medium, re-exporting or cleaning those meshes, re-exporting from um, Blender and then importing into Tivori. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, it's still uh, hacking your way around. Uh, that sounds very familiar. Exactly. And <laughs> exactly. It, it's kind of like everybody's responsibility and nobody's fault in a sense. Uh, yeah. So I see, yeah, you're going somewhere else. Meanwhile, guys, uh, I hope that was useful, uh, Simon. Uh, by the way, Gravity Sketch is also something very nice uh, because uh, some of the 3D models are great to be made there and they have a tool that, uh, that flips the normals uh, because that, that is really like uh, tricky. Uh, so if you use Gravity Sketch, uh, there is a tool for that. You don't need to go to Blender, for example. Um, so here we are. Guys, again, ask questions while me while Mohammed is showing this new uh, design. Please go ahead. Yeah, so um, I'm showing you another use cases that I used to worry. It wasn't a design for VR, so I'm just saying that you need to master your tool and use that whenever it's useful for you. It's not necessarily VR. I've seen many projects created in um, Tivori, but for traditional animations, for example. So it's not limited to VR experiences. Uh, when I was working on this AR concept, which is, by the way, live on my Instagram as an, an Instagram filter, I wasn't sure about the animation. So I needed to quickly try some sort of animation, some sort of animatic to understand which way is the way that I'd like to have it. So I ended up using Tivori because it's really easy 
to basically move things around and auto record those keyframes without thinking about the easing, without thinking about your frames, your keyframes, your geometry. And it was really fast. So I achieved these three, I think, under one hour. And I ended up, okay, I know what, what exactly I want to build in the Spark AR. So going through those, you can see I have three kind of different animations for this. So um, starting with just having these, these are meant to be yeah. um, not rotating like a an, on an orbit around the box. Yeah. Mohammed, maybe just to show can... also people, right? Because sometimes it's kind of like hard to grasp how that was made and what does it mean. It's it's easy. In a sense, could you maybe grab a sphere and, and show them how to animate it in one way or another? Sure, sure. Let me create a new scene. I think that would be easier for us. Okay. So um, I'm not sure if I'm using my windows in a way that is Yeah, yeah, it's really visible. It's, it's useful, pretty broad, yeah. pretty wide Perfect. angle, yes. Okay, so okay. let's go to packs and that's UI, not UI, probably primitives would be better. So I grab this sphere to make it a bit look better. Let's give it a color like this. So now we have a red sphere and I'm going to open my thumb timeline here. Let's get rid of this window. It's really cool to throw things around yeah, yeah. when you don't need them. So this is the timeline, for example, and we have one object to move around. The easiest, not cleanest, obviously we're talking about concepts, we're talking about quick iterations, is to turn auto key if you want to do one key like the start and the finish of your animation but if you want to record the entire movement you could go with the rhyme uh, real time hit this and it's now recording as soon as you grab your object and move it it will record the entire animation so for example i could do like a crazy this is animation is it is going to be silly but now you can watch it Okay, maybe so, yeah, 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 clear. It would have been it would have been better if I would start from here. I'll go back. Where's my? Oh. Like this. I don't know. Sometimes <laughs> this happens. Yeah, we we, we make a new one. <laughs> Yeah, it's always the case at the end of seeing new one works better. So another time, yeah. real time, I'll grab this. And yeah, now you sense. have kind of a falling animation. As I said, it's not clean, it's silly, but it's quick in terms of understanding your animatic. It's um, easy to understand your goal. If it's really the thing that you want to achieve, now you could go back, tweak those keyframes or come up and replace this with the actual model. Let's say you wanted to drop to do the same animation with a cup. So you don't need necessarily to stop to start with the actual final model. You can start with primitives, do your animations, replace those, or then refine your kind of animation. Yeah, yeah. Is that yeah. enough? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because then we why would, if you could go back to that scene and then I would ask you, for example, you have for you have made three kind of like different ways for those, let's say, serials or sphere, however you call them. Uh, to basically move. Uh, just curious, why did you pick one other than another? What was that worked better for you? And how did you make that decision after creating that little concept? Yeah, I tried to make sense to find the rationale, to find the logic, because uh -huh. then, okay, what's the reason that you're rotating around this? What's the entrance? What's, what's the intro? How the scene would start? Mm. So this one looked like a loop. So I didn't want to have a loop. I wanted to have a start and finish. So that was the main reason that I crossed this option. And then I had these two kind of things. The so one, the serials jumping from the back. Yeah. It was nice, kind of exciting. But I thought, okay, maybe we could imitate the same uh, kind of movement that you have experienced using, um, pull, basically pulling your ball every day. You're really uh, familiar with this sort of animation. If we go 
to this. You can see a better view of that. Not this one, the second one. Yeah, this one. So this is this kind of animation that you see every day using opening your box and pouring it in your bowl. So I thought that would be more familiar mm. and that would help a lot. That okay. was kind of the rationale behind it. Okay, and of course it makes does make a difference to kind of like see it once you have done it other than kind of like imagining it, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, and, and it also depends like how quickly can you create something like that uh, in order to basically like assess it. Right? Exactly. Because if it takes yep. uh, uh, two days uh, to animate each one of them, or maybe you don't know how to do it, because that's also a very different exactly. important topic. Huh? Yeah, that's the main point. Because when I started working on this, I wanted to have this animation. I thought this is the best idea that I could come with. But as soon as I quickly created that, I thought, nah, that's not. That's not the, the one that I want. It doesn't feel right. So I iterated, I came up with three different, and then I picked the one that I wanted to use. And I think that's it. That's the one that I wanted. So being able to quickly put your ideas into some sort of a test, it's really helpful, especially when you talk about 3D, because it's time consuming, coming with concepts, coming up with models, with the timeline, and hitting the render would take, depending on your hardware, your graphic card, your CPU. Yeah, it's yeah. a big headache. And that is, uh, yeah, and we go also to another other big problem, and that's indeed, uh, right now, uh, Mohamed, of course, is using the, the, the uh, uh, Tvori on a, uh, on a VR-ready PC linked to the Oculus via the Oculus yeah. Link. But of course, yeah, indeed. Exactly. That, is, uh, that is one of the things that we see, and that is why, really, uh, we are investigating, we investing, in a way, heavily uh, all our resources to basically, like, push this on, on Quest, really, to allow everybody to then... Uh, create it specially uh and, and then create those kind of these kind of prototypes in different ways right i mean we are not even sure that we are going through the animation part that we might find different system in order to allow people to tell story about their uh their xr app so i don't know if people here are uh they already joined uh, our community of beta tester if you want to know more or if you have an oculus quest you should really really join our community we organize also meetup actually um every two weeks where we kind of like show our progress in vr so you can also meet maybe next week be with uh, with uh, uh, Muhammad maybe or with some other designers so that's uh, uh, sure do it because I think it's uh, it's uh, if you are into XR design and if you do have an Oculus Quest that will be very likely the most easy uh, way to enter this and I do have one question uh, uh, Simon uh, how is your workflow how do you edit correct a single keyframe after a recording I think you should send him a message. I can answer that directly <laughs> because I think right now it might be tricky to go back and, and, uh, and show. And there is another question from Matt Davis. Can colors and text treatment, for example, bolding, be edited uh, frame by frame? So colors and materials, yes, yes. in Tibori. Yeah. But the text, if you're, if you're asking, let's say, turning a button, a, a text label like Mo to Gabriella at the moment it's not possible in Tivori. No, exactly. Uh, you could do that. some sort of trick. Yeah, you could do some sort of trick having two texts and fade those kind of things together if that could help. Yeah, I, I'm not sure. It really depends right, what, what people are after, right? So I, I wouldn't yeah. recommend it to be honest. But hey, maybe maybe it's going to it could work. Uh but tech, but color and materials, yes, something that can be yeah. uh, animated. Um Guys, we are heading towards the end. So if you have any more questions, I think it's, uh, I wouldn't even say now or never, because I mean, uh, uh, well, you can find him certainly on, uh, uh, on LinkedIn. You can reach out to him. You can also reach out to me. Uh, that is uh, absolutely uh, possible. But please go ahead if you have any other question. So, and meanwhile, Mohammed, I, I do have maybe one last question. And that is what, when you look kind of like down the road in six months from now, what, what is that makes you excited? What, what, what is like, I, I, I see this coming or, or I would like this to happen. Uh, what is that you would, uh, I mean, look, I, for me, it's for your quest. I'm already going to tell you because it's, it's just going to blow my mind. I mean, being able to do this with you together, it would just, it would just be incredible. But really, you yeah. as a designer, when, when you're thinking about how how this is moving what we, is that you would like to just just 
uh, will, will make you excited. Um, I'll, I'll let you know about my biggest nightmare. I'm trying to learn Unity. It's super complicated for me, at least. I don't know. Maybe I'm too old to learn <laughs> such a big, such a deep application because I don't, I don't code, and that's the main reason. So my dream would be having Tivori or some sort of VR application on Quest, not being further to my desk, not being further to a PC, and allowing me to do interactive prototypes, yeah. not just animation. That would be like my Christmas dream, my Christmas gift. Yeah. That would be amazing. The interaction part is uh, it, it's very fascinating. I mean, and, and uh, one thing that we were also heavily thinking is about, of course, you need those interactions, you need those triggers, and how to basically yeah. allow to, in a way, program, but not really program, right? Because then you go exactly. back and not make it accessible again. Yeah. Uh, to be fair, there are, there are two um, VR applications out there that allow you draw at the MVP level, but they allow you to start experimenting in, in interaction. They're not there yet. Mm -hmm. But if you try Minsar or Builder, Builder spells B Y L D R, um, those are started a good good way. But the robust experience that you get from Tivori is another thing. Yeah, yeah. So I want kind of a marriage between Tivori and Builder. And builder, Builder, I have somewhere. to check it. Builder, I have to check it because. Mitsa, I was I was not happy about it. I was like, what am I trying to do here? Why I cannot move this box? I just, I don't know, it just didn't work for me. Uh, but I see people that are, are trying to do something with interactivity, with some, I, I don't know, I just, I, I, I'll try to spend more time in there because I'm like, this should yeah. work, right? People are doing it, so there must exactly. be a way to do it. Uh, I uh, must say, at the moment, there is no streamline pipeline for this creation even in big companies like facebook or unity there are multiple pipelines it's good and bad the good thing is you could come up with your own pipeline do it whatever you like if you would like to if you prefer to start from blender start from that if you prefer starting from Minsa or tivori do it um bad thing is it could be quite daunting could be quite overwhelming to a start but if you stick with it you'll see the payoff. Yeah, that's true. There is like any tool, there is always a learning curve, right? I mean, you always yeah. will need to figure things out and it's always going to be uh, maybe a little bit uncomfortable. So I think that in order to make an assessment, right, as you mentioned initially, just play daily. So like, okay, you do like this, maybe half an hour, maybe one hour, just trying something out. Ah, forget, fuck it. And then you go out and, and you leave. But then the day after, two days after, you go back and then you, you explore. And I think it's also dependent on the community around it and if, if people are, are willing to help and, and share because sometimes it's kind of like tricky to enter and learn and get to get those things troubleshoot so that's also something that could be uh, that, that's also uh, indeed important uh, i do have um I have one or two more questions if we have the time uh bruno vega says have you guys heard about magical hands proof of concept for vr animation to be honest, I don't even know how far gesture-based animation tools have developed. I, I I don't know, but you know what, what I was thinking actually, that that when we think again and we have think of, we have thought about it about um, having Twilio on Quest and using the hand tracking in order to simulate those hand interactions with the, with the pass through. Uh, I don't know if that's what you what you are mentioning, uh, Bruno. But then technically those movements with the hands could be recorded and could be used also to, to create simulation. But I'm not sure um, if, that's, if that's the case. Um, uh, someone, Mohammed, suggests to check a VRTK add-on for Unity. So I heard that, yeah. It's, yeah, that, that helps. Yeah. That, uh, that's my goal as well. At the moment, I'm playing with VRTK and Game Creator to basically not code, but even combining these two together takes a lot of time and effort in, in, instead of just clicking something. So if you're familiar with a um, prototyping tool for product design, like InVision, Framer, XD, those are super easy. And that's the main the goal, because you as a designer, you shouldn't be involved with the clean code or developing your software. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, um... Guys, I think we are uh, out of time, or in general, I mean, I think that we have exhausted the hour, so and uh, thank you very, very, very much, Mohammed, for your 
uh, for your input uh, this evening. It was really, really useful to, to kind of like understand how to approach and, uh, and uh, how to make that transition from 2D to spatial design. What are the things that have to be uh, taken into account? So really, really appreciate it, Mohammed. It was a pleasure and thanks everybody that joined no right this evening. Uh, and uh, Mohammed, do you have anything, any, anything else that you would like to share or? Yeah, I just wanted to thank you for having me. Thank you for the everyone working on Tibori. This is a really good application. This is really empowering. And I hope that it was helpful for people out there. Absolutely. Thank you for Certain, joining. I think it certainly was. So thank you very much, Mohammed. Thanks to everybody. Uh, stay, stick, stick with us around uh, on our social media to, to follow how this is moving, how this is going to move forward. And uh, in general, get other designers excited about this because uh, share it with others, because the more we are uh, and the stronger we are gonna be and the less developers are gonna put their hands on final products because we don't wanna see them. <laughs> okay, thank you very much again, Omar. bye-bye. Bye. And the stream.